So I made something today. Already this morning, I made something. Anybody interested in what I made today? All right, I made a mistake. <laughs> By 9 a.m., I had already made my first of several mistakes before I even got here. I'm really good at making mistakes. I make a lot of them. And there are experts who say one of the reasons that I make a lot of mistakes is that people tend to do what they're good at. And I'm really good at making mistakes. And the thing is, I used to not have as, as much of a, a, a loose attitude about the mistakes that I make. And this is a, not even something from a long time ago. I used to just like absolutely torture myself when I made mistakes. Whether they were small mistakes, I would beat myself up over the mistakes. And if there was a mistake of any magnitude, I would obsess over it over and over and over and over and it would play on me and eat on me until I would just be unable to cope in a lot of ways. Has anybody ever been in this situation where you've made a mistake and had this just kind of going over and over and over? Absolutely, it happens to a lot of people. And one of the reasons that this is the case is because there is this expectation in some of our heads that we're supposed to be perfect. There's an expectation set inside of us that we are supposed to be perfect. Sometimes this comes because of childhood trauma. Sometimes it comes from broken family systems where there are people either in a marriage or another relationship where the person has such expectations of you that the consequences are so severe when you make a mistake that it becomes this impression that you have to be perfect. And sometimes it comes from religion, most powerfully sometimes from Christianity. There are denominations in Christianity that will not let you come to the communion table, the table of Jesus, the table that says all are welcome, graciousness, forgiveness, all that kind of stuff. You are not welcome until you have made yourself flawless, until you have made yourself perfect again. It is a very damaging perspective and has hurt millions and millions and millions of people and is still taught today. It is one of the reasons why we're doing this series, If Then, and continuing this for a while because it gets to the core of the nature of the relationship between you and God, between me and God. And if we get that right, it then it points us in a direction that affects our actions, that shapes who we are, and our actions also shape what the world becomes. And if we get it wrong, then it leads us down a different set of actions that have different consequences for who we become and who we are and what the world becomes. So this is very important, this nature of the relationship and this idea that we need to be perfect and driven to be perfect. So we're gonna dig into these scriptures today and see what it has in store to tell us today. And we're gonna start with the one from Matthew and it's Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. And this is where sometimes the source of issues begin when we take the scripture without putting context behind it, without talking about some of the translations and things that can lead us down a difficult path. And it's obvious how it can happen. Because in this verse, it translates as be perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Seems incredibly straightforward. But it is very problematic when people take that directly as it is and say, you need to be perfect. Is that really what it means? Because what that leads us down is this path that we talked about earlier, where someone is going up, going to a faith, going to a religion because they need it, because they're trying to find God in a way that's going to help, because they've heard about this living, forgiving Jesus and need that grace. And they get there sometimes. And someone says, no, you cannot come to this table. You are not welcome to this table to have one of the sacred things that we do, to have one of these symbols of openness and welcome. You are not welcome here until you come through me, until I certify that you are worthy of coming to this table, which is one of the most absurd things that happens in this world because Jesus only had messed up people at his table. Jesus only had broken, messed up people that Jesus ate with. You never read a story about Jesus eating with the people who are all okay. This is one of the most twisted, distorted forms of the faith that can possibly exist. And it leads to another problem because when we are, when we are told these things, it can lead us to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, bad. 
and have negative self-talk and to consider ourselves bad, which is another thing that is reinforced by some faith communities, which says that our nature is bad, that we are born sinful, that we are born with the problem, that we are born not all that. They were not born in our very nature worthy. The issue is this. The word that Jesus used was not perfect. Right? And this can happen sometimes when people are looking, well-intended people, because this is one of the better translations that is out there, and it is a word that is used in almost all of the translations. When people try to take a word and literally translate it, and miss the actual meaning, the deeper meaning, because the deeper meaning takes more words sometimes, and they want to keep it elegant, and so translate to one word and end up with a really messed up theology as a result. The word that Jesus used in the oldest translation we had, because Jesus didn't speak Greek, but the oldest translations we have are from the Greek, used the word teleos, which means true. Right, true, not factually true, but being true to something. Being true to something trying and striving to be like something. And what are God's characteristics? In Luke's gospel, Luke has an exact parallel to this verse. And it says, not be perfect, it says be merciful as God is merciful. Jesus is trying to talk about what are the traits that God has? What are the traits that God asks us to do that we can be true to? Be merciful, be kind, be gracious, be helpful to other people, do things to make this creation better, do your best. Because when we, when we think we have to be perfect, it's not an achievable standard, so we give up on the standard and we end up with a much lower standard. But when we're asked to be true to God, to strive to do these things, it can cause us to escalate to a higher standard. Place. Now, what about that reading from Genesis? And why did we go through that whole reading? We're not going to go through the whole thing over again, but we're going to go through some significant parts of it because it's important. Because if you're going to understand the nature of our relationship with God, two of the sources that are great to go to, one, hearing from Jesus, which we just did, and two, go to the very beginning. When there was nothing else but God in the start, and ask God what God thinks about the nature of creation and the nature of our relationship with God. So that's what we're going to go to next. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. When a wind from God, the Ruach of God, the Spirit, the very nature, the essence of God, swept over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. God said, skipping down to verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the land earth and the waters that were gathered together the seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation and plants yielding seed and fruiting trees. And God saw that it was good. Verse 16, God made the two great lights, the lesser light to rule the day and the greater light, sorry, the greater light to rule the day and lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth in the dome of the sky. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things. And God saw that it was good. God, which we represent, is light. Because sometimes when we just use the word God, it is so corrupted. Sometimes people hear the word God or Lord and think negative things because the word of God has been used so much to abuse that sometimes it is hard to hear that word and accept it. So we represent God not just as a word, but as light that gives us direction and points us in the right direction and helps us see where we are to go. And this God, from the very beginning, created and separated the waters from the land and created this planet and called it good. And then God created trees and fruits and apple. And in one of the great examples, if you need an example of just how broad God's love and grace goes, he called kale good. Who calls K 
kale good. Nobody calls kale good. Nobody. God calls kale good. That's an example of God's grace and love. And God created the sun and the moon and the stars and called them all good. And then in verse 31, God looked at it all. Humanity, the planet, fruits, birds, swimming things, everything, all the different things that we welcome to bless next week at the blessing of the animals and called it all very good. Called it all very good. But you know what God didn't call it? God didn't call it perfect. God called and God looked at everything that God had created and called it very good, but God did not call it perfect. And at this beginning, there was only God. There was nothing else. God created out of God's self and created everything we've heard so far. Nothing messed up. Nothing happened. God created it all and called it very good, but did not call it perfect. And so if God, before anybody interfered or did anything, created this and called it very good, and if God created all of this and didn't call it perfect, why should you be perfect? Why should you be perfect? But God calls it all very good, and that includes you. That includes each and every one of you. Doesn't say you're unworthy doesn't say you were created sinful, doesn't say you were created in any way less than. God created you and called you and called this very good, which means there are very high expectations for you. Not you are unworthy to come here until you make yourself perfect, but you have been created in God's image and called very good. And so Jesus says, we're not just supposed to say, oh, okay, we're not all that and that we can't do all this stuff, but no, you were created very good, and so I have very high expectations for you. And no, you're not expected to be perfect, because that would require just some ritualistic, ceremonial thing to pretend you're perfect, when none of us are perfect to begin with, and no ceremony, and no person blessing you or saying anything is going to make any of us more perfect than we were before we went through that ceremony. You will never be made better than you were created, which is very good. And so Jesus asks us to be very good, to try really hard, to have those attributes that we have been given because we have been created by and through God, and that is our essence, to be able to do these things for ourselves, for each other, for children, for poverty-stricken people, for wealthy people, for yourself, for your family, for friends, for people you've never met, for people outside there, for people on the other end of the earth, and people who haven't been born yet. A hundred years from now, that we are being asked to step up and live into our nature, which is not damaged, not sinful, not unworthy, but very Good, which means we have the potential to make an enormous difference in this world. If you buy into this idea that you were born sinful, if you buy into this idea that you were born unworthy, then that will lead you to a way and a psychology and thought and series of actions that will impact the world in a negative way and has been for generations, and it's time for it to stop. Because if you accept that your very nature, that your creation is very good, and that you and we are expected to live into that, then how you feel about yourself will be better. How you feel about your neighbor will be different. How you act in the world will be more noble. And how we change the world will be good. The world needs us to be very good. 
If we do that together as a community of faith, we will have fun with little children. We will listen to the pops and crackles that go on and smile and not wonder, oh, is that okay? Because that child was born very good and the sounds that are made and the crackles and the pops and the cries and the whines and our cries and our whines when we, mix the, when we mess up are all beautiful because your nature is very good. And if you accept that, then your life in this world can be very good too. Amen.